Welcome everyone, my name is Carrie Wood. I'm the state representative from the 29th district, which is Newington, all of Rocky Hill, and a part of Wethersfield. Anyone come here by train today? <laughs> bike? We got a biker, any walkers? And walkers, all right, we have some walkers, thank you. Um, we are here to talk about the freight rail that runs through our town here in Rocky Hill and Wethersfield. And we're going to hear from the players, um, Genesee, Wyoming, and we're going to hear from Connecticut DOT, and we're going to hear from our town historian, Bob Heron, who happens to be covering this topic right now that many of you have seen in the Rocky Hill life. So we'll start with Charles Hunter from Genesee, Wyoming. Um, let's see here. I wanted to do a brief intro. Um, Genesee, Wyoming leases 116 freight railroads in the US, UK, and Europe and they employ over 7,300 people. The company provides rail to 30 major ports, rail and ferry service between US and Mexico, as well as transload, switching, and repair services. Charles came all the way from Vermont. I really appreciate his time. Charles, would you like to start? Sure. Well, thank you, Representative Wood, for inviting us. Uh, we appreciate You've always been very cooperative and supportive of the railroads, and uh, we greatly appreciate uh, working with you. So I am the AVP of Government Affairs for GNW. Um, I cover basically all the Northeast and Midwest states, so I work a lot with the DOT team, uh, the legislators, um, both the state, federal, and local level. I have Maine to Wisconsin as my territory. Um, Connecticut's certainly a very important state. Our headquarters is uh, down the road in Darien, so we love Connecticut. Um, I've also got Bobby Garland here with me. He's the general manager of the Providence and Worcester Railroad, which is actually the operating railroad through here. So I'll let Bobby talk a little bit about what we do around here uh, with the trains. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for... Uh inviting us down to have a conversation. So basically, just kind of an overview of what we do in Connecticut um, in general. The majority of our traffic flows into Worcester, Mass, and then it kind of runs down through Plainfield, down to Groton, New Haven, and then from New Haven, we have the ability to come back up to Middletown, and then Middletown to Hartford, and then we do get traffic from West Springfield that comes down into Hartford, and then we got traffic that comes off the um, NECR. But anyhow, so what we have currently is we have one train that typically operates between Middletown and Hartford right now. It is uh, intermittent. It's not on a regular schedule. We might run to Hartford one or two days a week, um, sometimes during the day, occasionally during evening hours. Most of the products that we carry, we carry wood for Home Depot. We cover, we carry some uh, block for Northeast Builder Supplies. We carry uh, steel for Klockner Metals. And then we have a CND company coming online that we will be moving some construction and demo. That'll be starting up sometime probably later in uh, late August, 1st of September. Um, and what we will see during that time is we will see the interchange starting to be five days a week probably between Middletown and Hartford. That will be primarily during daytime hours because once that business comes on, we'll have a regularly scheduled job that can, that can make that move. Um, and then the other customer or service is Red Tech in Portland, and that traffic sometimes flows to Hartford. Um, that is like uh, dirt that has been cleaned up. It's packaged, put in guns, and then it goes back and forth. That's once or twice a week we do that with, uh, with Red Tech. Um, that's pretty much it for our operation that travels through Rocky Hill. Here. Thank you. So while... Um, PNW is certainly an important railroad. In the grand scheme of things, it's just a, a cog in the, in the giant wheel of the rail network of the United States. So that gives you an idea of all the tracks that are out there. 
that potentially connect with the PNW to come in here or out of here to move traffic. Uh, as Carrie said, you know, we, we serve ports, other railroads serve ports. Uh, the railroads also link into Canada and also into Mexico. Uh, so GNW is in the, the freight, primarily in the freight train business, and these are some projections of how much freight is supposed to grow. Um, so you can see that things are, are going forward to move more freight as the years pass by. What's on a train? Bobby told you a lot about what are in the specific trains through Middletown, but generally speaking, uh, you know, we operate the Connecticut Southern over here on the Amtrak line. Uh, the PNW goes down into New York City and Worcester, as Bobby mentioned. So there's all kinds of different things from, from feed to um, cooking oil. Uh, we have we service lays as far as um, getting grain in there for their facility. So. You don't think about it, but a, a lot of things that come out of your refrigerator or your store shelf probably got here on a train. They may move in connection with a truck for a local delivery, which is certainly where you, we partner with a lot of trucking companies on final delivery and pickup, but a lot of things move by, by rail. Here's an idea of uh, how much things are on the train. We're not moving any coal uh, anymore. We used to move coal through uh, Port of Providence, Rhode Island, but that, that hasn't moved in several years. But everything else, we, we certainly haul grain. We haul vehicles to the Port of Davisville, Rhode Island on the, on the PNW. A lot of lumber comes into Connecticut. We service Home Depot um, in Windsor. And there's an idea of, of Overall freight, the Association of American Railroads puts out statistics for each state, and that'll give you an idea of what's going on. Over 15,000 carloads moving within the state of Connecticut. This is a comparison of other modes of, of uh, transportation, trucks, trains, barges. Of course, water is the most efficient way to, to move freight. There's no doubt about it. but um, Trains are way more efficient than truck, especially on longer hauls. A lot of pub public benefits. We reinvest a lot of capital in these rail lines. And even though Condot owns this line, we're responsible to maintain it. Um, as a lot of you probably know, it was out of service for, I think it was around eight years. Uh, the previous owner did not maintain it. So when GNW bought it, we put several million dollars into the track to safely uh, bring it back into service. Um, we have other lines that we either own or lease that we provide all the capital. Um, each job at the railroad supports several other jobs. Uh, you know, Bob listed several of the companies, so those companies and those employees depend on this freight rail service to bring their commodities in and out of Connecticut, support those jobs. Uh, environmental is, is very friendly when it comes to trains, you know, moving one ton of freight, 480 miles on one gallon of diesel fuel, that, that's very efficient. That's, I always think that's a pretty impressive number. You can have hundreds of truckloads that are on a train, the equivalent, you know, if you're coming through here with 10 cars, that could be the equivalent uh, easily of, of 40 truckloads that could come if they were on the highway instead of the train. Next. We're gonna go through the presentations and then um, everyone can ask questions. Uh, next up is Matt Burns from the, is that who's pre presenting? Yes. Okay, from the um, Department of Transportation to talk about their rail lines. And I'm going to close this. Here we go. What do we press to, John, what do we press to just start? Have our IT guys. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start the presentation. Then you don't need that, right? Thank you. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Burns. I work with the Office of Rail with the Department of Transportation, and I'm just going to do a quick overview of freight rail. So uh, there's 10, 10 freight operators in Connecticut uh, right now, Branford Steam Railroad, Central New England Railroad, Connecticut Southern Railroad, CSX, Housatonic Railroad, Naugatuck Railroad, New England Central Railroad, Providence and Worcester Railroad, Pan Am Southern Railroad, and the Valley Railroad Company. And then I have a little map here for you. Those uh, are the rail lines in Connecticut. Um, some of them are privately owned. Some of them are owned by the state. Uh, and this is available on our website as well, if anyone is, is interested in that. Um, so on the Connecticut property, I just wanted to talk quickly about the rail freight service operating agreements. Um, we have several of these in the state. This is on our property. We lease the, the rail to the operators, and like Charles kind of highlighted, they, they maintain the property, they invest in it, um, you know, so it's kind of a partnership on that property. And we have a few throughout the state, so I just wanted to quick, quick hit those. Uh, Central New England Railroad has the Griffins Line, uh, which is Windsor to Hartford, and the Armory Branch, which is Enfield to South Windsor. Uh, Housatonic Railroad Company is the Berkshire Line, and that's North Canaan to New Milford. Uh, Naugatuck Railroad has the Torrington Secondary, which is Torrington down to Waterbury. And Providence and Worcester Railroad has the Middletown Cluster and Weathersfield Secondary, and that's the P&W that we're talking about today. Um, and that's the kind of Hartford to Durham, and then there's the tracks in the Middletown and Portland area. Okay, I just wanted to quickly talk about the relationship we have with GNW. Um, so like, like Charles said, there's three railroads in Connecticut right now, uh, Connecticut Southern, New England Central, and Providence and Worcester. And uh, we do just want to say they've been a great partner to us and the citizens of Connecticut. Um, like Charles said, they do. They invested money, they reopened lines. Um, basically all the commitments they lay out to upgrade infrastructure, improve safety, reliability, and maintain a competitive environment, we see them come through on. Um, so we just want to come out here and say, you know, that they've been um, a great partner to us. Um, and they definitely embrace the opportunities for public-private partnership. If there's any uh, federal grants available or any kind of things, we're, you know, we're always talking to them and working with them to try and, uh, you know, get, get the best for the state of Connecticut. I uh, just want to quickly go over some goals in the future of freight. Um, Again, we're not the operators, so a lot of that is all done through, through the operators, but what we try and push for is to see an increase in capacity. Um, like we said, that can reduce trucks on the road. Uh, less trucks on the road uh, makes everyone happy, and uh, to reduce the energy consumption as well. Uh, we want to highlight the safety, so we want to maintain a state of good repair, and um, we also want to make sure the grade crossing improvement projects go ahead. Um, you know, anytime a car or a pedestrian passes a railroad, we want them to be safe. Uh, we also want the locomotives and the cars to be safe too. Um, you know, it kind of goes hand in hand. Uh, if we can have better infrastructure for those, everyone's a little bit safer. Um, want to talk about economic development. Um, so there's definitely the opportunity for job growth on all uh, the lines. Businesses will open up. We find that businesses um, grow faster if they do use rail freight. Um, it does strengthen our economy and increase the resiliency of the supply chains, uh, which is something that in the last couple of years we've seen supply chains are important. <laughs> we want good infrastructure there. Uh, and then just want to talk quickly about state support for freight rails. Um, so like Charles said, they have to invest a lot of their earnings back into the line to make sure they can operate. Uh, we do try and help out and support in certain ways, though. Uh, one way is a tax-exempt program, some infrastructure spending that they do. Um, they submit to us, and if it meets certain criteria, they can get a tax exemption for that. And that's to help support the infrastructure, um, as well as sometimes there's grant programs. So like currently, there's something called the Rail Freight Infrastructure Program, uh, and that's a $10 million grant program. Um, it's a competitive grant program, so any freight operator is applying for that in the state. And we review those, and you know we would uh, approve grants to some of those. And that is also a public-private uh, partnership. A lot of those require money from the operators in order to get it. Um, so you know we kind of work hand in hand with with those things with them. And uh, that was what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. Oops. <clears throat> okay, we need, we need our ID. <laughs> Next up, 
we have um, Bob Heron is the town historian. And um, this was perfect timing because Bob is currently covering the, um, let me just see if I can figure this out. Uh, Bob is currently covering this in the Rocky Hill Life, if anyone saw it, over a three-piece series, and he has one more piece to go. So we're going to hear from Bob, who's a member of the Rocky Hill Historical Society. Yeah, I can, I can fire this up. Here we go. If can I? Like that view, do display settings. Yeah, that's the one I want. Okay. There you go. And let's go to the first slide. Okay, um, when I started working on this, I never considered what a dramatic impact the railroad has had on Rocky Hill. Can you fix that problem? Oop. Let me get away from the tech guy. I can say what I was going to say anyway. Um, you probably know that the history of this town, we started out as a river port. We used to send sailing ships to the uh, Caribbean, the South, uh, South America, and ultimately around the world. And we did that until about 1820, and then the steamboats came up the river, and our people didn't react well. They liked sailboats. <laughs> oh, well, what are you going to do? Um, around, well, around 1850, 1860, really, uh, the railroads took hold, OK? Uh, they started. You, you've seen old movies of the Civil War, the General. You've seen railroads, and they were very significant. Uh, you know, right after the war, they started building this thing, which is the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, okay, went from the west, went from the east, and met at Promontory Point right here. And I can't get my cursor to point to it. There it is, Promontory Point. Okay, so. Uh, Probably the Civil War had a lot to do with the railways getting started, because uh, before that, there wasn't much. There was carts, which didn't do much, or travel by water. Uh, they needed a quick way to get munitions and people around. The railroads worked just fine, OK? They became a really important part of our infrastructure. Uh, OK, so let's build a railroad. Um, as I say, they. They built the Transcontinental Railroad, Transcontinental Railroad in 1869, OK? And it was like the uh, dot-com boom, if you will. Everybody wanted stock in the railroad, OK? And kind of, they really caught fire. Um, this was their competition, believe it or not, which really wasn't much for competition. Uh, horses and buggies um, up and down Route 99. It was a terrible way to travel, dust bouncing around, not much fun at all. Um, OK, around 1820, they shot the first steamboat up the river. And our people kind of slept through that, you know, and kept building sailboats. And our maritime history sort of went down the tubes as a result. Um, this thing here is really interesting. The, at one time, that they had a, a horse and buggy deal like this on a rail. They used to come out from uh, Hartford to the Congregational Church in Wethersfield. And I found an authorizing document from the Connecticut Assembly authorized them to continue that line from Wethersfield down Old Main Street, down Glastonbury Avenue to the waterfront. But then people are sort of looking at these uh, extremely efficient machines and saying, do we want a horse and buggy or do we want an efficient machine? And they said, official machine. It wasn't that hard. Uh, OK. <laughs> All right, pop that. Um, so they built a railroad. They built the railroad in 1871, OK, it, when it got to Rocky Hill. Uh, dramatic things happened about that time. OK, again, I wish this pointer would point a little better for me. But if you look at this road down here, this is Meadow Road. And this is the picture in 1871. We had this cemetery road, which is really Pratt Street, used to go all the way down. To, to the waterfront. And this road, which is Riverview Road, used to also go right down to the waterfront. And they built the railroad tracks, OK? The railroad tracks were in north of this private road, so they had to turn both of these roads so that they now both hook up with Glastonbury Avenue. So 
right away the railroad had an effect on us. It changed our street plan. Okay. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. Ah, we also got off to a pretty rocky start. Like I say, the, uh, the railroad was like the dot-com bubble. Everybody was buying their stock. In 1867, they found out that, uh, what is the money they spent? The railroad had cost them $50 million to build, and they had been billed by this Credit Mobile Corporation, $94 million. So you may wonder, where did the $44 million go? Or maybe you don't wonder. <laughs> <laughs> it went into people's pockets. And of course, it, it caused, well, you can see from this flyer here, caused quite a bit of consternation. So here we were, Rocky Hill. We had this brand new railroad, which was a very sensible railroad to have. And nobody wanted any stock in it because they had been burned by credit mobile. So the first thing that happened was the Connecticut Valley Railroad went bankrupt, in spite of the fact that it was a booming business. It's strange stuff. I'm glad I don't work in business. Uh, OK, by 1880, we were in business. This is the train schedule, a Hartford to Middletown, and Middletown and Hartford to Saybrook. And you can see there are regular schedules. And what happens was Rocky Hill, which had been a maritime town, which had turned into a sleepy little cow town, mostly dairy farms, suddenly became a commuter town. And well, that put together a demographic of our population growth and decline in Rocky Hill. In 1870, we had a very small population. By 1880, we had a, probably increased by a third because people could take the train to town. So that's pretty nice stuff. <coughs> nice for the railroad guys, anyway. Uh, OK, uh, the other thing that happened was the Valley Railroad, which was our first railroad, went into Hartford and was able to hook up with the New York, New Haven, and Hartford. I'm sure you all know about that one. It's still around. Um, OK, uh, and what happens is you see all these real, little red squiggles here. Those are all rail lines. So you're in Rocky Hill. Suddenly, you've gone from, if I want to get somewhere, I have to either take a boat or a, a, a horse and buggy. Suddenly, I can get anywhere in the country in days, okay, weeks at the most. It's kind of an, an amazing quantum leap forward. OK, um, okay so the, the New York, New Haven, Hartford was such a popular railroad that they finally ended up owning Valley Railroad and everybody else. Uh, they also owned the steamboat lines. So the steamboats were still competition, but uh, the railroad owned them, so they didn't really care. If you wanted a luxury way to get to New York City, you took the steamboat. If you wanted a quick way, you took the railroad. OK. Oh, stories. Uh, there are a couple of stories. We have oral histories at the Historical Society. One of them is by Harry Hick and, and Sam Dimmick. And they, tell, they talk about the activity around the railroad station at that time which is incredible, apparently, in the early morning especially. And they talk about this one guy who owned a house where the uh, cement towers are now, if you know the, the riverfront. And he used to um, wait till the last minute, <coughs> till the train was practically loaded. And then he'd come running down the railroad track, pulling up his pants and <laughs> finishing his coffee. And he was a, a regular show. People used to laugh <laughs> watching this guy try to catch the train. Another story that's not on the slide is the guy who lived on Old Main Street, where Jerry Cherry's house is now, if you know that, there's usually antique cars parked out there. He had a big Newfie, and he used to send the, the, the dog from Old Main Street to the railroad station, pick up his newspaper, bring it home. So the, the railroad station was sort of a hub of activity, if you will. Uh, the other thing was high school. Little known fact, Rocky Hill didn't have a high school until 1958. So if you wanted to go to high school, well, if you wanted to go to high school before the railroad, you didn't. Or you moved to where the high school was. Uh, when the railroad came, you could commute to Hartford or to Middletown on the train and go to high school. You had to pay tuition, but uh, you got to go to high school. Hartford Public High School, which some of the best people, including me, graduated from, uh, used to be a very high status school. They used to charge tuition. They were the second oldest uh, secondary school in the country. So if you were in Rocky Hill, you could go to Hartford Public High School, which was pretty nice. Uh, OK, pop here. 
Uh, freight in Rocky Hill, okay. We talked about passengers. There were two, really two things the train carried were passengers and freight. And when I say freight, I include mail, okay. So freight, at one time, a third of all freight that shipped on the Hartford Connecticut Valley Railroad was loaded up or discharged in Rocky Hill. So we were pretty important. Uh, you know, we had an industrial park on Dividend Pond. We had an industrial park off France Street. Uh, Bellam Bellamos uh, down in Dividend Road was another one. So we had industry. I think we had industry because we had the means of moving things, which is the railroad again. Okay. An another interesting thing happened with the, the train was a, was a real shot in the arm to South Glastonbury. Because uh, uh, when, the, when the train came through, the people of South Glastonbury could put their goods on the railroad, put their, or put their goods on the ferry, take it across the river, bring their finished goods back, put it on the train. And it, their, their economy boomed. Okay, uh, a little more on that, because I think it's a funny story. Over in Glastonbury, they had uh, feldspar quarries, a fulling factory, peach farms, tobacco farms, uh, quite a bit of industry, and they had to get across the river. Uh, the way they got across the river was on the ferry called the Rocky Hill. And it was underpowered, didn't have much storage space. The people in South Glastonbury hated it. And the guy who ran it was sort of a, he also ran an excursion service and a store. And uh, if he wasn't in the mood, he didn't run the ferry which wasn't good. Okay, so um, the South Glastonbury people were not happy with that, so they launched a campaign and replaced that ferry. They look the same size, but they're not. The, the lower ferry, the Niagara, is much bigger. Okay, the funny thing that happened, oh, what happened, I didn't mention demoring charges, what happened with the Rocky Hill was um, their raw goods would, would arrive at the Rocky Hill Railroad Station um, and they couldn't get them on the ferry. So they put them on a sidetrack. And they charged them what they called demurring charges until they picked up their goods. So these guys were, were paying to have their stuff sitting there doing nothing. And they wanted to get it across the river. So what do you do? They had a campaign. They finally managed to get this ferry, the Niagara, purchased. And the funny thing about it to me is, for one thing, they moved the operation of the ferry across the river. For another, the name Nyog is the Wangonk Indian name for South Glastonbury. So, so much for the Rocky Hill people. <laughs> they were not happy. It's funny to read the newspaper stories about this. Okay, and they they quibbled and quibbled and quibbled for years until 1917. The state of Connecticut finally said enough of this, and they took over the railroad, and it's been running reasonably effective. Oh, the ferry, I'm sorry, and it's been running fairly reasonably ever since. Okay, Compl a complication with the railroad that you guys might want to talk about this later is, um, okay, you had a train that was a mixed load of freight and passengers, okay? You pull in, you gotta unload the freight. What do you do with it? If you look at this slide, there are two tracks. There are no longer two tracks. One of those tracks was a side track. So you'd have to pull the train up onto the side track uh, probably uncoupled with the cars that had the freight so that the people could get to work, basically, okay? Especially when it was mail, because you just couldn't dump the mail. You had to take care of the mail. Uh, so sidetracking was a problem, and it, it slowed down the operation in general. Uh, there was also a problem of pilferage, because the mail often contained checks, cash, what have you, and bad guys would prey on the railroad and try to rob it. So. You can see Charlie Yeager here. I wrote an article about him. One of his jobs was to keep them from robbing the trains. Uh, OK, so what happened to the trains? Uh, over time, OK, passengers first. In 1909, a, a trolley line came through. And the beauty of the trolley is, for one thing, it has a more regular schedule. There are more cars. There are more trains going. There are more frequent stops. And it's cheaper. So let me see, train, trolley, train, trolley. You know where I'm going. I'm going to town on the trolley. Uh, in 1930, the trolleys were replaced by buses, OK? And as far as I can see, the buses still follow the same track that the trolley used to take, same stops, same everything. 
And every time I've read about it, a trolley stop, there's a bus stop there now. So it was just an upgrade. Another thing that killed passenger service was cars. Uh, way back when, when not even everybody owned a car, uh, the Terry Hick that I was talking about a while ago, he and a bunch of friends carpooled. They went from as far away as Higginham into Hartford to go to work and then back again. But even at that, it's a lot easier to set your own schedule and take a car than it is to take the train. So cars cut deeply into the passenger service. Uh, as far as freight, uh, the Silestine Highway was built in 1930 so that you could ship by truck, which people started to do. And then in 95, Interstate 91 came through, and that pretty much did it for freight on, on the railroad. You know, it's pretty much all trucks now. Uh, we um, have recovered a lot of the lost freight traffic because of this Burroughs Depot, and I want to talk about this a little bit. I got one more slide that I didn't put on here. If you look at the, the far picture, if you went around that corner, there's about 20 bays there where you can back in tractor trailers. And inside there, there are forklifts. You can move things around. There's no sidetracking issue. It's fairly easy to, to move cargo from one truck to another and dance it around. So as a spot, it's a pretty nice spot. Um, if you've driven to New Haven or Springfield lately, you know that this is a nice spot. The highways are in terrible shape. I was just talking to my colleague Tim about that a while ago. The highways are in bad shape and they're getting worse. And I heard one of these fellows say a while ago, how about trains? So maybe. <laughs> it's a thought anyway. So what's going to happen to the railroad station? Because it's all we got left. The, the train goes down the tracks, but they don't stop here. It's because they don't. Um, OK, the, the, the station has had a couple of permutations, if you will. Uh, this building in the back here one time was Guide Tool, uh, a little machine shop. The problem is that in uh, 19, 2011, we had a snowstorm, the roof collapsed, and it did such damage to the building that they had to tear it down. Okay? Uh, the front of the building, you probably know if you've been here for any length of time, uh, Sally Farrell ran a store called Tapestry Rose there, which is a, a craft store. And it was a nice store. Problem you run into with this building is parking. Where do you put the cars? I think that was the problem she ran into more than anything else. Um, let me see. Yeah, I've, I've talked to these people, the fellow who owns it, um, and uh, John Castellino, who used to own the building, is a fount of information. And he loves the history of the place. I love talking to him. So that's where we are now. I'm not sure where we're going with it. I've, you may know, you probably do know better than I do. Uh, they, they were going to build a new building in the back, right? No, they took down that building and added on to the main building. Oh, OK. I thought they were going to build another building. OK, so that's where we stand now. We have two empty buildings. I think they're charming. I think they're loaded with history. And I'd like to see something good happen to them. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> These speakers are going to remain up here, and I'm going to have Sydney walk around with the microphone if anyone wants to answer questions or ask questions. I would just ask that you speak into the microphone, because this is being recorded for people at home that couldn't join us. Hello? All right, any questions? Sydney, do you want to bring it to people, or do you want me to do it? OK, so bring it to this gentleman right there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rocco Orsini. I live at 21 Old Windmill Crossing in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. This is a question, I think, for you, Matt, uh, from uh, DOT. In your presentation, you said one of your main goals was safety. And so I'd like to talk about the, uh, the railroad tracks that cross roads. Right now, every, every crossing has a stop sign, OK? And I believe you said there was one train per day, maybe two trains per day with the goal of maybe five trains per day in the future. So what you're doing is you're, you're, you're requiring everybody to put their brakes on to stop at the stop sign because of the train. But there is no train. There's only one train. 
And what's happening is people understand that now, and they're flying right through the stop signs. They're, they're, they're not stopping. Secondly, you're getting overgrowth, okay? So even when you stop, a lot of us seniors have a lot hard time turning our heads because we're trying to see behind the bushes if the trains are coming. So it's getting to be very difficult. So my question to you is, when we did this, why didn't we put in flashing red lights? So when the train comes, there'll be a flashing red light, and then we stop. Instead of now you've got thousands of cars jamming on their brakes 24-7. Uh, That's my question. Sure, I can, I can dive into that. Um, my name's Steve Curley, and I'm with the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Please, sure. My name's Steve Curley, and I'm with the Connecticut Department of Transportation, and I'm in the rail safety section. And so back when we, uh, as Charles mentioned, we kind of reintroduced the uh, train service, uh, you know, the state had, um, did an FRA, did a series of evaluations and reviews uh, taking everything, and, you know, from track structure to approaches at the railroad crossings. Uh, one of the railroad crossings does have active devices. That's Route 3. It's a four-lane undivided highway that has a ton of ADT. But most of the uh, crossings uh, in Wethersfield and Rocky Hill and Cromwell have a lot lower ADT. Uh, and um, so we, we had to reinstitute the minimum requirements that are put on the states in the railroads through what they call the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, MUTCD. And the absolute minimum standard to start out with is that you have passive devices at all private and public crossings. And those, and the devices that are mandatory are a railroad cross buck, either a yield or a stop sign, and an ENS sign, which is if somebody gets stuck on the tracks, they can call a 1-800 number, reach out to the railroad hotline, and the, the train, if a train is coming, they can take appropriate action. So based on the amount of train traffic, the ADT, the speed of the roads, that was, was gonna be instituted on the town and municipal roadways. Now, private crossings are a little different. They have different types of passive signing. Uh, usually it's a private crossing sign because somebody's been granted the right to go over that private crossing, okay? But uh, it, gets, it was asked, but we do have in the state of Connecticut per the federal, uh, excuse me, highway administration, we're required to run a, a public uh, grade crossing program. It's called a 130 program. And you know we have over 360 acts or more active crossings in the state of Connecticut. And everyone is given a priority for roadway improvements. Uh, and those roadway improvements eventually Usually when a, a, a crossing becomes a candidate for a project becomes we will put active devices there. Uh, the program is, is limited in the amount of money that we can spend per year and it's based on a priority. So uh, at the time when uh, the rail line was getting reinstituted, uh, the, the priority for these crossings were low because there was no train traffic. And, and, and they've since come up higher. And as we're obligating existing projects and future projects, uh, these crossings eventually might become candidates for greater safety enhancements, such as railroad active devices. And uh, well, I think Matt did mention that, um, you know, there's some freight assistance uh, grants coming up. And part of the grant that PNW put in uh, did include some improvements, more, more of a crossing safety improvement to the crossing surface um, in their grant. So they will be, you will be seeing, uh, you know, the railroad through probably a contractor uh, enhancing the grade crossing surfaces at a couple of the crossings, you know, within their grant coming down the line. But in terms of uh, flashing red lights, um, that is not currently a standard at Condot. It's, it's experimental, and there's all different types. There's the kind that flash all the time, there's some, and, and, and some towns are using them, and that's all right, because they're allowed to use them on municipal roadways. Uh, some are, um, you know, they're, they're activated by the sun, some are activated by sonar or some kind of device, so some go on all the time, and, and they're just, and people will start ignoring them because all it is is blinking 24 hours a day. It's no different than the stop sign. And, uh, and then some are, so we've seen some towns use more of a radar or some kind of sonar type of device that only when a car 
goes, comes near it, approaching, that it will be triggered. In fact, the town I live in, West Hartford, that's the type of signage that they're using. It is experimental. We're waiting on a new MUTCD, like everybody in the country, to see um, whether or not it becomes a full standard. And if it is, then we would be instituting it. But that would come at a great a cost. And uh, so we've been you know, hesitant to make it a standard at CONDOT. Uh, we surely, if the towns wish to do it at a railroad crossing, they could at their, ex at their expense. We would, it would have to be approved by CONDOT. But we, you know, we would review it, make sure that it makes sense. Uh, at all the great crossings, just so you mentioned why there were stop signs, be, and you made up that point was that some of there's a minimum standard of sight distance when you do stop somebody, okay? And at a lot of these crossings, because of the geometry, because of the roadway approach, stopping sight distance, the bottom line is that it didn't meet the requirements to probably put up a yield sign. Now, on the line, there is a couple of crossings that do have yield signs in certain locations because the sight distance is okay. Uh, at a lot of them, they're not. So there's either building obstructing, a tree, a private property, which we can't go on. So the decision was made, working with the towns, when we met with them to say, we're, we are recommending this minimum standard treatment, stop control. And in a lot of them, we put advanced stop signs to notify everybody that this unusual stop, although required at a grade crossing, is coming at you. And if you go up and down the line, you will see advanced you know, stop signs where you normally wouldn't maybe in, in your intersection near your house, okay? You don't see that all the time. So, you know, that requirement's in there. And, uh, you know, that's the reality. It's motor vehicle law that people are supposed to be stopping. Uh, you know, all I can say is in the future, coming down uh, in the next couple of years, you might start seeing more of these grade crossings that have active devices, railroad flashing lights and gates, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to just clarify about the traffic, just, just to make sure I'm understood or we're understood. We are currently only operating from Middletown to Hartford once or twice a week. So what that means is you'll see the same train going up and coming back. So that's one round trip. And late August, early September, we'll have one train going both directions five days a week. So you should only see the train twice and unless there's something unusual going on where we need to make an extra trip for some reason. But as of right now, that's where our traffic's at. Hi, my name is Joan Wood. I live on Stillman Walk in Wethersfield. And 11 of us that live on the street are literally a uh, hundred feet away from our back door to the track. And I want to know, if you're delivering um, building material, why is that train coming at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning twice? Twice in one night. It goes. Half hour later, it comes back. It blows the whistle right by Knott Street, and it's horrible. There's no reason that I can see for it. And my other question is, if it is building material, what are in those big barrel cars? So the, the big barrel cars are coiled hopper cars. They're actually gons that have rolls of steel in them, and then there's a top set down on top of those. And those actually go to Klotner Metals. Um, rolls of what? Steel. They're rolls of steel. Steel Correct. Coils. Coils. Coiled steel. Coils, yeah. But they're in a in a big tanker car with the top on the. It looks like it holds water or some kind of chemical. So. I I will have to check. I, there is a industry in New Haven called Safety Clean that does reprocessed oil. Yeah. It's like it's like. Uh, it's like oil that's been collected, I guess, by uh, service locations. And then it's, it gets taken to safety clean. They load it, and then it goes to get processed to get clean to be reused or recycled. So will you have any hazardous waste ever on that track? So what? there is a Class 9 dirt that moves out of Red Tech. It has 
uh, I don't want to speak out of turn, but I think it's like PVC type material that's gotten in the dirt. And so truckloads come into Red Tech, it gets loaded into an open gun, and there's actually a bag, it's encapsulated in a bag, and then that moves on uh, the rail. So, so at night, right now it doesn't make economic sense for us to have a job on at during the day to service the, the trip up to Hartford. And we don't do it on a regular schedule at all. It's when we have availability to go up there. We work with our partner railroad CSO. Um, sometimes they actually come down and get the freight. Sometimes we take it to them. Um, so that's why you're seeing the, the trains at night. Um, so you wake up hundreds of people. Yep. Twice, twice in one night, periodically. Yeah, and, and, and I can understand, you know, the frustration, especially if the line, you know, was idle for a while is, is kind of the back history I've, I've heard. Um, but, you know, we've got to stay competitive and we kind of have to do what makes economic sense. now. What I see happening in the future is we will have the we will have sufficient reason to put a full-time job on up there in the near future, and majority of our trips will be daylight hours because that what's that's what makes sense to the customers we're serving. So you know, hopefully we can see that shift, but I, I can't say where that we're never going to operate at night on this line. That's. Uh Yeah, so, so it's a long trip for us. Um, because of the speeds and the class of track, it, it's a long trip for us. We, and we currently, it, it's like a three hour trip each direction. So we're looking at like six or seven hours for our crew to go up and back right now. And that's, I understand. Good evening, Sandy Kelly, 25 Tollgate Road here in Rocky Hill. We hear about uh, self-driving autonomous tractor trailers being developed and even put on the roads now. Is there a plan? Is this in the future for freight lines to be autonomous or self-operating? You know, industry-wide, I imagine that there's probably some, some look to that. Um, I can tell you that as of right now, it's nowhere in our future for what we do. We, we are primarily the last mile or the first mile. So what that means is we get freight from the big carriers like Norfolk Southern, CSX, CN. They do the long haul across country. So economically, it would make sense for them to go that route. We're the last mile, which what that means is a train of 100 cars comes into our terminal. We have to have the bodies to separate all those cars out, put them in tracks to which customers are gonna to go to, and then go deliver them to the customers. And because it's more labor intensive, we need a couple of bodies. Um, so I don't see that anywhere, you know, in our near future at all, so. Okay, um, I don't know where the town line is, but on either Middletown Avenue in Weathersfield or Old Main Street, Rocky Hill, the, it, the road crosses over the track. And you need mirrors there. The, I mean, I don't care if you're young or old, you cannot twist your body around to see uh, if anything's coming. Yeah. The crossing that you're mentioning, uh, Middletown, right on the town line, and, and also further down near near Hartford, um, Hartford at Road, is they're both very skewed crossings. Um, there's no doubt about it. Middletown Avenue is a little bit tougher because there's obviously the bridge there too. 
and there's been some overgrowth because of the relay you know once again there's different properties owned by different people Eversource is responsible for trimming uh, brushes in, in their territory and, and the railroad is also responsible uh, they have a vegetation program uh, that's approved by Connecticut DOT and and uh, the uh, and deep uh, that they spray once again so the railroad right away doesn't get overgrowth but you know once again he water, everything, they spray periodically, it, it grows back quick. So site distance can be challenging. Um, what we will do is uh, we did initially when we kicked off three years ago, these reviews before the line started, we did a, a site, site distance analysis uh, and uh, we can take a look at that again. Uh, once again, mirrors aren't something that while used and widespread everywhere, they're not a DOT standard. And, and the reason why is because we'd be being asked by everybody for mirrors all over the place. I mean, literally. And, and so, uh, you know, while we could probably maybe institute them at some of the more skewed as maybe a practice, and we'll take a look at that, we just don't want it to become like, a, a, you know, commonplace all over the place. And because all we're doing is putting this stuff up, and, and, it's, and it's a maintenance endeavor, and, and they're not needed, and then everybody thinks they're needed. So we gotta look at the stuff at a case-by-case -case basis. So we will, though. I will I'll pass that on, and we will go back out there and uh, review what we originally have for data, and uh, maybe make a recommendation. We'll share it with both the town and, um, and uh, you know, going up the line at DOT. Um, depending where it gets put in the right, if it does get in the right of way, we're gonna have to see who's gonna maintain it, too. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Question in the back. You have emission control for automobiles, for trucks. Is there emission control for your engines? <laughs> emissions with an E or? Yeah. So they they are diesel locomotives, and they. Depending on what year they're built, they are built to an EPA tier standard. So, yes. Are they checked yearly or every two years? The question they, was, are they checked yearly or every two years? There is an annual inspection on locomotives. Anyone else? Just a quick question. Are you going uh, all electric? Um, no, um, that's very difficult for freight railroads to do. It, some railroads were done back around the turn of the century and you still have electrification on the Northeast corridor, but even the freight trains that operate on the Northeast corridor, including ours, are, are diesel powered. Um, it's a huge expense to, to build, a huge expense to maintain. Um, you're in a lot of rural areas. Um, they have to get power out there, so I, I just don't see it. Hi, I'm, I'm Bryce Hardy. I'm from uh, Weathersfield. Um, so we are so fortunate to live in a really great community, uh, Weathersfield, Rocky Hill, that connects down to Middletown through Cromwell. Um, I'm also a business owner. I see a, a really um, a great avenue for pedestrian traffic. Um, I imagine things like um, the Essex steam train um, carrying passengers having um, maybe a dinner. Um, is that a possibility on these rails? We don't have passenger rights, so that's, that's up to you guys. Yeah, you, you currently, go ahead. Hi, Angelo Luberis, I'm with the Office of Rail, uh, Connecticut DLT. Yeah, there's uh, no passenger rights at the time on that line and, um, you know, it's a different dynamic when you operate passenger service on a line, so it would require significant, you know, investment in infrastructure and equipment. Can can you explain a little bit about the um, financial relationship between the state and G and W? Um, it was my understanding that we allow. You know, the rail company can operate free of charge as long as they maintain the tracks. But at some point when that line becomes more and more profitable, the state may share in the revenue. Does the does GNW sort of report what the revenues are to the state in order to figure out what 
what kind of compensation the state could ultimately get from that. Well, we have a contract as, as you state, and we do report the business on the line as required by the, the agreement. Yes, we do report that. And as I believe uh, Charles had mentioned earlier, um, you know, they're required to make investments on the line to the infrastructure and um, to ensure that, you know, the freight trains are operating safely on the line. So they, and they use their funds for that. One last question, we'll be good. Uh, Bob, Bob has a question. Bob, you can ask in the microphone. I'll ask in the microphone. I, yeah, it's a question about that line of sight where the highway goes over the bypass. Um, I, I have the same problem this fellow has, that I can't lean back that far to see if there's a train coming. My assumption has been that the train has a mandated speed, and it's a slow speed and that it's gonna blow its horn when it comes close to that thing. So I'm trusting my ears rather than my eyes in terms of is there a train coming? Am I trying to kill myself or is that a good idea? Listening to the train? Yeah, <laughs> listening so, for the train. Just to go over what's required by federal law for us. So we are required to sound the signal 15 to 20 seconds prior to occupying the crossing. So that is a standard that we hold to greatly because we do take our responsibility in the community seriously in terms of warning people over crossings. So we do sound the horn 15 to 20 seconds prior to occupying the crossing and we'll also have our headlights, ditch lights on. So we, we, we are bright, um, should be. So the speed on this branch is, is 10 miles per hour. That's, that's the fastest we can operate between uh, Middletown and Hartford. Thank you everyone for coming. I wanna thank the speakers, Bob Heron, Connecticut DOT, Genesee and Wyoming made a long trip here um, to be with us and answer questions that I get from everyone all the time. Um, I do wanna also thank the Rocky Hill Parks and Rec for hosting us and John Murphy for handling our IT. And um, please stay and talk for a little bit if you have some time, thank you.